Welcome to The Rational Egoist. I'm your host, Michael Leibowitz. As a proponent of capitalism, one of the criticisms I've come across, uh, maybe more than any other, I I'm not sure, but the argument is that under capitalism, you're going to end up with children working basically in broken down factories and, you know, dying in droves. But this has never been my understanding of what child labor was like during the Industrial Revolution. And I recently read a good article on child labor by today's guest, so I decided to have him on. He's an economics PhD student at West Virginia, West Virginia University, and he holds a bachelor's in economics from Grove City College. He's been here before. Benjamin Sievers, welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you for having me back, Michael. It's always fun to come on and uh, talk to you. Sure. So in my mind, child labor is mostly associated with the Industrial Revolution. So mm -hmm. what were working conditions like for children during that period? Yeah, so th there's a number of studies on this. And uh, uh, Lawrence Reed, former president of the FEE, actually wrote an article a long time ago, I think in the 80s. He uh, commented it in the comment section of my, of my article, so you could easily find it. It's, in child, it's entitled Child Labor in the British Industrial Revolution. Um, and essentially, he makes the argument that, look, the, the child labor, uh, the they are much better off working in the factories than they were in uh, pre-industrial revolution times. Before, uh, before they were starving, uh, they may not have been uh, in terrible conditions, uh, like, I don't know, you get the image of the giant vats full of molten steel moving and, like, stuff dripping down and, like, evaporating people. You get those images that the popular media ha has uh, uh, drilled into our minds. Uh, it may not, that may have been happening, sure, uh, but at least they were able to feed themselves, uh, earn money, earn an income. And uh, Mises talks about this a little bit. It, it, it's not that the, the, the housewives were stolen from the kitchens and sent to factories. It's not like the children were taken from their play and sent to, uh, the factories. No, it's not like that at all. There was no plague because there was no food. People were starving. There was no food to cook in the kitchens. Right. So it, this actually made people better off than they were otherwise. Uh, right. There's a, I think it was in Reed's piece where he talks about um the the romanticism of the pre-industrial times. Um, he they it's it was described as you know doves flying around, honeybees buzzing, and people frolicking in the in the in the uh, the hills it, it, that, that's just it's baloney uh and and if, if they if they if that was so great if that's what they were abandoning why did they abandon it in droves why did they go to the factories in droves it makes no sense it doesn't follow and you know a lot of things are like this you um the, the policy makers base their decisions off of these fantastical uh representations that never really existed uh like you know they ban nuclear energy because they think that nuclear waste is barrels full of green acid and, or they or they uh uh they they like the meat packing laws they think they read up in sinclair's the jungle a jungle and they they think there's rats falling in and people like mixing it all up together and terrible disgusting working conditions that the fiction drives public policy but it yeah. has no bearing with reality um uh, there's a uh, there's another article that Lawrence Reed cited. Uh, it was uh, I forget who wrote it, uh, but it was entitled "How the Industrial Revolution Raised the Quality of Life for Workers and Their Families." And a lot of the evidence that was being used to push for banning child labor was from doctors, doctors of which who did not uh, take an oath, and they did or did never even visited the, the factories. So it doesn't. I don't think the article goes into like why they might have been lying but there's definitely some there's definitely something off about that when the people who don't even know what the conditions were like are testifying about the bad sure. conditions yeah i actually was going to ask you about what life was like before the industrial revolution because it, it's not as if these kids you know they were outside sledding <laughs> yeah. in the winter and then coming in for some hot cocoa and then all of a sudden these factory owners went and snatched them up yeah. I mean, I mean, the Industrial Revolution ultimately raised living standards, raised quality of life, life expectancy. Yeah. So 
one of the problems in in Lawrence Reed actually pointed this out is that there were two types of labor. There was the free labor yes. system, and there was also the parish apprentice system. Mm -hmm. Do you know anything about these two and what the difference was between them? Well, the, the I haven't done much research on that system partic in particular, but I, I did read the article, and he, he discusses it at length. The uh, parish uh, apprentice apprenticeship system seems to be what people were criticizing the most, and they were attributing the failures of the parish apprentice system to capitalism, when in reality, they were actually, uh, the Paris apprenticeships were actually basically government programs. So these government workers who would basically take control of unwanted or orphaned children would send them to work in factories. So it, it, it's, it's not at all a uh, representation of uh, capitalism and more just a failure of socialism. So if these, pe if these kids were being mistreated, which it seems like they were uh, by these uh, government workers, you can understand it in this way. Well, why would they have incentive to actually care about the child's welfare? The children are just resources for them to manage, and they don't make a profit from it. They don't make a uh, they don't make a loss. They're just bureaucrats managing children. It's the same thing with the Soviets. Uh, uh, there's this uh, uh, paper by uh, I think it's Robert Tolleson and uh, Ellickson, where they invest where they compare and contrast uh, slavery in the Soviet Union between slavery in the American South. And in the in the South, since the owners, you know, both systems are terrible, but since the owners of the slaves in the American South actually made a profit and loss from the slaves, they were actually incentivized to take care of the slaves, to not just flagrantly kill them and for no reason. Whereas the Soviet uh, slave managers, we call them, they didn't actually have, there was no profit and loss. They just if, if they if they were annoyed, maybe they were having fun killing killing the killing the people in the gulags. They they just did it like it was like nothing to them. And they didn't bear much of a cost at all. They they weren't making a loss from that, like monetary loss. So it's the same. You could probably the same principle could be applied to the Paris system. Uh, these bureaucrats they didn't they weren't making a profit or loss from uh, abused children. So it, that abuse probably uh, grew tremendously under that system because of that uh, incentive they faced. Yeah, you're going to get us both canceled. I can see it now. <laughs> Seavers goes on Leibowitz's show, defend slavery. <laughs> because that's what people do. They take things yeah. woefully out of context, push yeah. a narrative that they you know already are, are, have a preconceived idea of, and they ruin lives over it. And this situation that you're talking about with this the parish apprentice system, from, from my understanding from reading Leonard Reed, or rather Lawrence Reed, is that... <laughs> It's another situation where the government is screwing something up and yes. people attack free enterprise and criticize it. You know, the other day I, I asked a question on Twitter. I said, are there any real capitalist candidates out there? And mm. this guy says, all of them are. And I'm just thinking, are you like, really? Like, that's what you think capitalism is? You think it's a situation where you have Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, mm -hmm. deficit spending to, to the hill, minimum wage laws, the Federal Reserve manipulating the currency. But people do think that. And so capitalism ends mm -hmm. up taking the blame. So eventually this child labor comes to an end, right? For, for By and large, I mean... Yeah, mainly in, because in, of the free market. Yeah, in the industrial. Well, that's good. You're, you're preempted me here, Ben. <laughs> so give me a give me a minute. I'm I'm trying to frame this thing just perfect okay. for him. Yeah. Set it up so you can knock it out of the park. So in the industrialized world, child labor for the most part comes to an end. Why? Because most people think it, it required government legislation prohibiting these evil factory workers from abusing children because that's really what they want to do is just abuse kids. So they think the government stepped in and saved the day. That's not my understanding, but uh, you know, I'm not an economist. I, you are training to be an economist. So what is your understanding of this? Yeah, my understanding is simply that the free market system and the Industrial Revolution, uh, mainly the Industrial Revolution, allowed uh, the development of capital, the accumulation, reinvestment into, into technologies, which in vastly like it increased our ability to uh, produce consumption, consumer goods, improve our welfare dramatically. Um, and this, uh, you know, increased real, real wages, you know, what you're able, how, how much you're able to get to satisfy your ends. It, it vastly improved our ability to do that. So as that happened, the uh, necessity of 
sending children to the mines, factories, or the fields, that wasn't as necessary as it was before. Uh, as as the capital accumulation uh, grow, grew and people were able to uh, satisfy more of their lower value ends, you know, improve their welfare more easily, it wasn't necessary to have their children work. And, you know, parents, if you have a kid, I mean, you, you don't want them to be uh, suffering in the fields or suffering in the in the fact because regardless they're going to be suffering if you send them to work whether it be in pre-industrial society or, or post-industrial society not post-industrial but like you know industrial society uh, you know so that 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 is what actually um, eliminated child labor and if 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 it wasn't the right time like because usually when when um when government when the government bans this stuff it's already on its way out so like. Uh, Child labor is already on its way out during the Industrial Revolution, uh, starting to decrease. Um, uh, obviously, it wasn't totally el elim elim eliminated. It needed some more time. Uh, but, you know, when they ban child labor and start regulating it, it's, they're usually taking responsibility for what is already naturally happening. Workplace accidents is, one th is, an, is another example of this. Before OSHA was put in place, John Stossel has a good thing on this. I think he also does this with child labor as well where he looks at workplace accidents and he's like, well, they, they start when OSHA, the, the political uh, uh, people like who are in favor of these laws, they, they show you where OSHA is put in place. And they're like, oh, look, all these workplace accidents, they started, you know, they started the fall, but they don't look at the 20, 30, 40 years before OSHA was right. instituted. And they're already, it's like a straight line down. Like it, OSHA was yeah. practically not even effective. Like it, it just was, it's like a bandwagon. It's, it's just jumping on, onto the trend uh, while it's on the downward trend to make politicians look good. You know, in Connecticut, in, in Connecticut, uh, they did this with crime. They passed these laws that I thought were horrible uh, laws. Yeah. And then they said, well, look, you can see recidivism went down after the laws. So I went and looked into it and it turned out that recidivism was actually dropping at a faster rate prior to the laws. And then it, it mm -hmm. sort of, you know, it, it, it starts to level out a little bit. But nonetheless, you know, most people don't have time or the inclination to look that kind of stuff up. Yeah. So they just see, okay, yeah, after this past, good things came. Thomas Sowell pointed the same thing out in relation to the, the well-being of African Americans, where it, it said, well, look, the Civil Rights Act happened and, and they were better off, but the trajectory was actually yeah. better prior to that. And I don't know, I don't know how you get around that it, when people just, you know, I guess they don't have time when you, when you're working and supporting a family, you don't have time to study economics. You know what I mean? So yeah. what, what was the story that prompted you to write your article? So um, people usually send me some headlines whenever they come up and they're like, Hey, what do you think about this? And that's what happened. Someone sent me uh, this uh, CBS article or on child labor and uh the the controversy was that mars which has previously uh can make commitments to decrease child labor in their in their fields in ghana and there might be some other countries too that they employ child labor in but ghana was the one that was being referenced uh cacao fields they, you know the children are working in, in cutting out cacao beans for for for, for mars's chocolate i'm sorry mars um and the cbs special report uncovered that uh, there's still a lot of child labor being used despite promises uh, to the contrary. Um, now, among the chocolate companies under attack are Hershey as, as well. Um, Hershey also employs child labor. Um, Nestle, I think I think they produce chocolate as well, uh, candies or some sort, and they, they also employ child labor. Uh, the few Hershey? Other companies, yeah, Hershey. Hershey. You yeah. didn't know Hershey produces chocolate? No, no Nestle. I was saying Nestle. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. I thought you said Hershey. Hershey. No, I, I moved on. I said Hershey than Nestle. No, I know her, Hershey. Pen, there's Hershey, Pennsylvania. <laughs> I, it's not too far away. Uh, but no, I know Hershey produces chocolate. And Nestle I, does as well, yes. I'll say, yeah, Nestle, I, I, I can't even name what they candy they produce. But anyway, they're, they're under Hershey and Nestle. Are, they're Wait under a second. You've well. never had a Nestle Crunch? Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I'm not... I'm not. Up, you got to get up on your candies, man. Yeah, yeah. Maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe if I have to write a paper that's relevant to that, I don't know. But, <laughs> no. 
Uh, but anyway, anyway, Mars is the prime. Uh, I guess the the ideal the ideal type here. That they're going after uh, Mars pretty hard. Um, and they want the Biden administration. There have been people who have been suggesting uh, the Biden administration use this law to prohibit importation of uh, Mars's products, finished products, or uh, the resources they use. Uh, because there's, there's apparently a law in the books that uh, allows the government to uh, prevent importation of of goods that use child labor as an input. So, but it, apparently that law is not used a lot. It's not very enforced. Um, and these act, there's a lot of progressive activists that are trying to get Mars to uh, uh, get the government to start enforcing it. Now, I see this, and I'm like, we should think about this. Think about this a little more. When you prohibit child labor, or you uh, use political pressure to make countries uh, enforce it in their own domestically, um, you are probably going to make children a lot worse off. And you're not thinking about the relevant alternatives. Of the child laborers now usually and, and paul krugman finds this as well you know liberal paul krugman uh at one point at least before he became before he won the nobel prize and became like a uh, a sellout a liberal uh, propagandist a liberal propagandist if you will left-wing propagandist yeah let's, left -wing let's, propagandist. Not, let's not benefit give him the benefit of the term yeah. liberal right yeah yeah <laughs> yeah i'm not gonna I'm, i should i shouldn't have said that he's not, he's not a liberal proper liberal proper uh, but a progressive propagandist. Uh, but anyway, he even used to believe this. And he, he found that a lot of uh, instances in which the U.S. used political pressure to force com for force countries to prohibit child labor, or crack down on it, or, use, or force companies to uh, fire their child laborers, the child laborers uh, went into prostitution or starved. Yeah, well, they need now, money, right? These kids, their yeah. families, they need money. They're going to do something to get the money. They're not just going to say, oh, well, the government says we can't do this, so we're going to starve to death. Yeah, exactly. And, and uh, some official reports, uh, some government reports found that some of, this, some of the child laborers just moved to like a rural factory where they could continue work, their work there without government supervision, because apparently it's harder to enforce it in rural rural settings. So at best... At the very best, it was ineffective. They just went to go work somewhere else. <laughs> at at worst, these children are going into prostitution, which I don't think anyone wants to see. Uh, none of the, at least none of the progressives, at least not yet. Uh, and or they starved to death, or they or they were more starved, or they're starved more than they were before. <laughs> so it's it harms people. Uh, but one of the things they used to get around this is saying, well, look. That may be true about uh, children who are voluntarily working, but what about slave labor? And this is what conservative conservatives in particular do this. They conflate uh, child labor with slave labor. They, they always do it. And there's no indication that, that, that in this case there's slave labor, but they always say that. They, they say that in every case when they try to, uh, they try to fight their trade wars and, and impose tariffs, they say we're fighting slave labor. Um, but there's little evidence that there actually is in this case. Um, and even if there there was, you still have this trade-off. You're not choosing between uh, enslaved labor and uh, free labor. You're choosing between enslaved labor in legal industries and enslaved labor in, in illegal industries. So what's the slave owner going to do when, it, when it's banned, when they ban uh, ch children working at cacao fields? Let's suppose there's slave, there's slave labor involved. Let's suppose that, just for the sake of argument, the slave owner is not going to simply just up. Oh, you're you're free now. You can, kids can go have fun, play in the fields, and chase butterflies. No, they're going to uh, use the slave labor in other fields of production, probably prostitution, which is a huge problem in Ghana. So you're you're choosing between slave labor in the fields and slave labor labor and prostitution. You're not you're not choosing between free and slave labor. That's just supposing that that's true, that that is true that they use mm -hmm. slave labor in these cases. So you still face the trade offs, and you're, you'll still probably make people worse, even if there is slave, even if most of it's slave labor, which I doubt it is. What do you think should be the labor policy here in America? Do you think that kids should be able to work if they want to, and their parents allow them to? Should there be any age limits at all? Yeah, I, I I typically think that the parents should have uh, some type of some level of say. 
Um, they're probably going to have what's the best interest of the sh children in mind for the most part, uh, the most, most cases they will. And whatever the children produce will probably come back to the household anyway. Um, that, but that, uh, I, I, I don't think, I'm not, I'm not sure how many children will end up working given how wealthy yeah. of a country we are, but maybe in a rural setting a ch uh, or a poorer area, a, ch a child may work and help support the family. I, I know, I've had friends that have had to do that before. Um, I live in a rural area, um, but um, there definitely should not be any government intervention. So some of it, a lot of it, it operates on the state level. So states have uh, worker licensing and age requirements. So here in Pennsylvania, well, I'm in West Virginia now, but back in Pennsylvania, um, there, there were child labor licenses. So when I started working, when I was 15, maybe I started in 16, uh, it's hard to remember, but like when I started working, I had to get it so license. long ago, right? It was, yeah, yeah, well, it's a long time ago, five I had to get years or so, to eight years, yeah, yeah, it's crazy. Uh, but I had to get a license and he had to go to like my school to get it. And there, and uh, if I remember correctly, uh, my, my father had to come with me, but the problem is, you know, I, I was lucky my father was my father doesn't have work on Mondays, but some people like their, their parents don't have time to go stop into the school during normal business hours to pick up a teacher, to, not a teacher, a, a, a child work license. They, they don't have the time for that. It's just another barrier. It's just another way. It's a way for at least the schools maybe to prevent their kid, prevent kids from working outside of school time so that maybe they can boost their test scores or uh, perhaps have a reason to uh, 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 kind of assign more homework. Maybe they're using it to uh, like, they, they, right, their logic is probably that Oh, they, you can't have these kids working. I mean, they, we can't have these kids working because they'll look badly on us when they don't study as much or something like that. Maybe that's the logic. I, I've heard that before. I'm not sure how true that is, in generally speaking. Um, also, there were hour hour limitations. I think at first it was 10 hours for me. Then after I hit 16, it was 20. Um, and of course, when you hit 18, you don't need to. There's no limitations on hours. Um, so yeah, there there was a lot of. Uh, intervention and all that should just be eliminated you shouldn't need a license to work as a kid um it's probably a, how labor unions protect themselves too you know they they support child yeah. labor laws in order to uh, protect their union members exactly um you know it, increase their wages um it, it, it so yeah you, there shouldn't be any licensing requirements no hour limitations no limitations on what you can work in so uh before before age of 15 if you have a uh, uh, family business you could work. Uh, but if you didn't have a family business, I think you maybe were only regulated. Uh, you were only allowed to work in maybe farms. Uh, but that, that, that entire, that entire limitation regulation should be eliminated as well. Uh, the children should be allowed to do whatever they want regarding work. Um, but of course they have to get hired to do that. So they're, they're not going to be performing heart surgery. I mean, I'm, I'm sure someone might, concoct some type of argument that makes it makes it seem like oh if we legalize child labor they're going to be doing all this stuff they don't have the education for and, but like why would an employer want that uh that, that that would just seem to me like a uh unnecessary risk and not very uh not profit mask maximizing what do you think about other labor regulations beyond the child stuff like uh 40 hour work week or mm -hmm. mi minimum wage laws or licensing like to be a barber or even a doctor. What do you think the effects are of those type of laws? So um, all these policies do the same thing we were talking about earlier. They chase friends. So most people right now are getting paid a wage. So like, what we were going to increase it to what? Uh, what people are making now or a little over what people are making. But when you, when you institute something like that, like a minimum wage, you cause unemployment. Now, uh, there have been some studies recently that show, uh, not not recently, probably in the past 20 years, like David Card. Alan Kruger. Him, Al, Al, David Card, Card and Kruger, the paper yeah. on uh, minimum wages in Philadelphia and uh, uh, and uh, New Jersey. Uh, New Jersey, yeah, you're right. You're right. Um, and uh, he won the Nobel Prize and progressives usually cite him to say, oh, look, minimum wages don't cause unemployment. But the problem is with that, well, one of the primary problems is his way he collected the data. And he basically just called restaurants and was like, hey, are you employing anyone else? Or are you employing any less than you were before the minimum wage? 
and I don't know who would pick up the phone, but like maybe like some manager who's still in high school or something like that, or or uh or I don't know some maybe some kid, like some fifteen year old kid who's working back there <laughs> looks around and is like, oh yeah, I think we are employing more people. Like, what? what how is that a good way of doing research? Uh, but uh, luckily he actually won it for his statistical methods, not like actual conclusions he makes, which progressives clearly don't read the paper or else like, or else they would know that or read the reason why he won the Nobel Prize. Uh, but uh, there's this guy named uh, uh, Neumann, uh, get his first name, sorry, Newmark. His name's Newmark, but he did a paper critiquing and he actually looked at tax data and found that unemployment actually increased after the minimum wages were put in place. So yeah, they're, they're wrong. Um, but also unemployment can take the form of other uh, uh, effects as well, such as decreasing the amount of hours someone works. So you're buying labor hours. You're not buying labor. Like what does it mean to buy labor? You're buying an hour, right. hour two hours, three hours, four hours of somebody uh, giving them, giving their effort and time to uh, help you produce something. That's what you're buying. So unemployment can take the form of just cutting hours, which does happen. Um, it can also... Uh, take the form of decreased work conditions. So they may uh, stop providing other amenities to their employ employees in order to compensate themselves for a higher minimum wage. Uh, so yeah, there's a variety of different ways the unemployment effect uh, can manifest itself in minimum wage increases that aren't necessarily uh, reflected in unemployment statistics. So yeah, that's one thing progressives typically don't understand or don't even care to understand because I, I don't think most of them are actually uh, they, they don't they don't actually care what happens I think they want to see their political policy prescriptions get affirmed and see their po politicians get elected and uh, perhaps maybe they get a job or an internship or something um, but they, they care more about uh, statements policies getting passed and actual consequences um, you know what else did you ask about I uh, I don't know, but I, when you, have you ever seen the movie? You're probably too young. Fast Times at Ridgemont High. I've heard of it. Is that uh, Rodney Dangerfield? <laughs> no, no, no. Okay. No, I don't know. no. It's, it I'm, I'm too matter. young. I'm but too there's young. this character. I think his name was Jeff Spicoli. He was played by Sean Penn, and he's like this real surfer okay. stoner dude, you know. So when you're saying these economists are calling these restaurants, I'm just picturing this guy picking up like yeah dude you know yeah, no, yeah we got we got plenty of people working here man <laughs> you know? like, like that's the type of that, that's the type of thing that I, i'm picturing uh how how old are you uh benjamin 25 uh, 22 22 okay now when people generally think about you know young people like yourself they're normally progressives in, in political views you're yeah. clearly not. And, I, you know, when I first came across you, and I don't know, this might have been three years ago when the, I don't, not when I saw it, but the video year. I saw. Yeah. And you were, uh, you were debating your, your political views and you were this young guy. And that's what got me to, to contact you. But how does a young guy like yourself, like, how did you steer clear of the trap that usually, or, or I don't know about usually, but a lot of the times young people fall into of supporting these big government policies that they call our ideals. Yeah, I think it, I think it's uh, uh, random, a little, a little bit of randomness involved. So I lived there, I grew up in a rural, rural area and uh, people there are just generally more conservative and not in favor of government intervention as much, you know, they have their pet policies and so on, but typically they, they have a disposition against government intervention. So I, I picked that up. Uh, but I do see people in my, who I graduated with supporting policies that, uh, not, not thinking them through supporting bans on child labor, supporting minimum wage increases, stuff like that. Um, I, I don't know. I suppose it's, uh, more, I don't know. I, I, I was exposed to a lot of, uh, criticism and, uh, skepticism of government at an early age. And that influenced my my political ends and my way of thinking. And I did discover Mises.org in high school. So I, I, I was educated on that. My, my economic education primarily came from uh, reading on there. I, don't know, I, I think I'm more interested in uh, what, what actually happens more than what other people are. And that's probably uh, biologically determined. Uh, so I, did... I think a lot of stuff is biologically determined, but... <laughs> 
did you read Rothbard uh, when you were looking through Mises.org? Yeah, yeah, I, I read uh, Man, Economy, and State. Uh, oh then I didn't read the whole God. thing. In, I didn't. I didn't read the whole thing in high school, but I, I was reading a lot of it. For, what a school. great! I, was, I did not read the whole thing in high school. Great <laughs> economics book. But it, it a, a friend of mine, well, he became my friend. He's a regular guest on the show, Jim Valiant. He knew Murray Rothbard when, when he was younger. We, you and I were just talking about chocolate bars. So he said Murray loved chocolate bars and he had these Hershey bars. So he, he's eating them and he starts complaining about it with, with this go goddamn mixed economy. Everything's going to hell. These candy bars are waxy. They didn't used to be <laughs> waxy. And I'm just cracking up like, geez, even even the chocolate bars, the, the mixed economy is <laughs> ruining. You know what I mean? Yeah, you, you can trace a lot of problems back to government intervention. Sure, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. It, it, you're very fortunate to have figured that out at such a young age. <laughs> you know, you know, you don't have to go through a life of supporting candidates that you would have been better off not supporting. So you do a lot of writing. I, I'm constantly coming across articles of yours in various venues. Where can people find you? Your writings? Do you have a website? Yeah, I, I started a blog recently as last semester, re as recent as last semester, entitled Seavers Insights. It's on Substack. So I believe it's seversinsights.substack.com. Um, but you can also find my Mises.org writer's profile. That's where I publish the most. Um, uh, it's uh, just go to Mises.org slash, I think it'd be Benjamin Seavers, or just go on there and search my name, S-E-E-V-E-R-S. -E -E awesome. Benjamin, thanks a lot. And I hope you'll come back again. It's always a good conversation. It was a pleasure. Thank you for having me on. For now, this is The Rational Egoist signing out. I'm Michael Leibowitz. Remember... I want to hear what you think. Leave your comments, leave your likes, your dislikes, whatever. It helps. Thank you very much. Till next time.